Uh, in the previous class, we concluded with the concept of uh, relative stability that if I want my poles to be not in the left half plane, but left of minus 1, can I do that or does, does my routh hurwitz criterion give me an answer to that? The answer was, was yes, you know, I could find out if the roots are to the left of minus 1, set it to the right or on the axis itself. But that may not necessarily be enough when I am handling design problems, right. So, what we will do today is to learn a technique called the root locus which will tell me little more about relative stability, right. So, what is this, this root locus all about? So, when I design a system, so I want the system to be such that it meets the desired specifications. And if we go to, to our earlier lectures, the specifications were usually either in the transient response or in the steady state response. So, in the transient st response, I wanted to speed up the response, but then I had a constraint of the overshoot. So, I wanted to speed up in such a way that I do not overshoot too much. And I also wanted the system to have, well, very small or no steady state error at all. But before I do this, I always wanted that the system should first be stable. If it is stable, then I can look at, at performance, right. So, until now what we did, we just followed some analytical approach while we do, while we were doing the routh uh, criterion. So, it does not provide, even though it gives me some information of relative stability, it does not give me too much information. I may need something more than just ask, uh, just asking the question, do the roots lie to the left of minus 1 or left of minus 2 and so on, right. And it does not really help in choosing parameters in that way, right. It does not help in choosing a control where, you know, when I really want a little more fine tuning of, of the system parameters, okay. So, if I, if I look at a, a typical closed loop system like this, right, and I just ask a question, what happens if I change this gain, okay. It could be from all values possible values from minus infinity to 0 and to plus infinity. What happens to the system? Well, the route survey does not really give me an exact answer to this question. Neither does it tell me any information about the settling time or the rise time, overshoot or even the steady state error. Right? So, for those things I need something little more sophisticated or little more, more in detail, right. Okay. So, let us see are there any techniques like that, right. So, as again, so what we will be interested is in the characteristic equation, the solutions of which will give me the location of poles of the closed loop system. So, we would like to know how the poles of the closed loop system vary by changing the gain k, okay. So, this thing or this, the locus of the migration of the roots of the characteristic equation as the gain k varies is called the root locus techniques introduced by W. R. R. Evans, you know, in, in, in his paper in 1948. So, what is this guy? This, this root locus is a technique, it is a graphical technique for sketching the locus of the roots of the characteristic equation as a certain design parameter. Here, it is it's, 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 it's this gain k. It could be something else also. We will see how we deal with those. When this design parameter is, is varied, and these are the first two, uh, two papers where, where uh, this root locus was first introduced. Okay. So, let us let us not get into that at the moment. Let us start with something, something very small, right. So, I start with a second order system. If I were just to draw it. Uh, I have in my uh, forward transfer function 1 over s, s plus a, I have h of s is 1, a plus, a minus here, again all these usual things of r and c and so on, right. So, the characteristic equation of the system 1 plus g h equal to 0 gives me something like this, okay. Now, the roots, okay, so I think I, I should also put a, put a gain k here, right, another block, okay. So, this will give me the characteristic equation in this way. So, the roots of this equation, second order equation, I have two roots minus a plus minus square root a square minus 4 k over 2, okay. So, let us analyze what this, 
how these roots change and what are the two parameters here A changes and K changes. Okay. So, for positive values of A, right, when A is greater than 0, minus A is always less than 0. Additionally, if K is also greater than 0, system is always stable. Right, and because this guy, right, because and the root always roots of the system always lie in the left half. Okay, the relative stability now depends on the location of the roots, right? So, and then I can, could see that by varying k, which is corresponds to my omega n in the second order analysis, this guy corresponds to two zeta omega n. You know, de dealing with the damping uh, coefficient also, right? So the desired trans transient response can be obtained by just changing this, maybe if, if, the, if the A is fixed, right? so given a, a transfer function A could be fixed. Okay. So, what happens? So, given A, there could be few cases because the roots of the characteristic equation depend on what is the sign of, of this guy. Okay. So, for case 1, when k is between 0 and a square by 4, the roots are distinct, right? I can just see very easily. When k equal to 0, the roots are at s1 equal to 0 and s2 equal to a. Mm -hmm. okay? So, let us let us uh, plot that for, for right? So, okay, I will just, just may plot it here. So, I start with k equal to 0, I am here, that is, is 0 and I am here, this is minus a in the s plane sigma and j omega. right? For k between 0 and a square by 4, right? so this guy would be real in that case. Right, so the roots would be distinct. Okay, so there will be somewhere. When I know that that there will be distinct, they'll just be real. This some somewhere on this in this axis could be here and wherever. But I know that I, uh, stability is always maintained because a and k are positive. You don't even need to look at the route table. Right here, maybe you can just trivially see that the route condition is satisfied. And therefore, when we were doing the second order system analysis for given zeta and omega n, which are always positive, we never worried about stability because stability was very obvious in that case, right? You can now just see that the route uh, criterion satisfies this very trivially, and therefore we were really never worried about stability. Okay, for k equal to a square by four, this guy disappears, and I have equal roots minus a by two minus a uh, at minus a by two. Okay, so let me just uh, say that this are when k equal to 0, k equal to 0. And when k equal to a square by 4, well, this is uh, at minus a over 2 occurs at k equal to a square over 4. Okay. So, when k changes from 0 till at least it reaches a square by 4, what I see that this guy starts moving here and this guy starts moving here until they both meet at this point right at a at a square at k equal to a square over 2 and this point is just minus a minus a over 2 okay now what happens after this right so k was between 0 and a square by 4 well i just say that these are somewhere here I, well i knew that they were somewhere on on the on on the real real line but now i know that when k equal to a4 you know they meet here so, they, so, this guy travels here, this guy travels here. What happens for k being greater than a, a by 4? Well, the roots are complex and conjugate and given by, by this number. So, what you see that after k becomes greater than a by 4, a is given to us, right? So, this guy remains fixed. Okay? So, all the real parts will be at minus a by 2 and the complex part will follow this guy. Which means, well, I am just uh, so the so there will be all the real parts are a by two here, and the complex parts will keep on changing. So when when k equal to a uh, k equal to a square by four, I am here, and then I see that I am just just moving around this this lines these lines and these lines. Okay. So this is for k greater 
than a square by 4 similarly here k greater than a square by 4 and we know that if there is a root here there will always be a root here right because of the nature of of the system right so the real part remains constant and the imaginary part varies at the gain k varies thus the roots move along a vertical line right here 1 1 so they go this way and this way so what do we observe right so as gain k for k equal to 0 i am just at the open loop poles okay as k increases both these guys meet up here and they again go away right to to they just keep going till infinity okay so something nice happen is happening here right so what information i used i just used this guy g is s sorry this is 1 over s s plus a right i i am not, I'm, I'm not doing anything with the with the uh, with the transfer with the, with the characteristic equation now and i'm just interested in how this k times g and then now this will be the closed loop okay uh, I'll not draw this out. This is so. I'm just taking this information, right? This is this guy. Okay. So what I observe for k equal to zero, I am at the open loop poles, and as k increases, these guys tend to move, and they direct, they decide to move, they decide to meet here, and then again separate. Okay. So so this is how if I just play a very small uh, video of this, right? So this is how the roots will go. something is okay right so if i give so again i'll just play this again k increases so this guy will go and then for log values of k and then go small and then again come back to the position okay so this is how, how the roots will move so this guy will go here and move this guy direction this guy will go here and move this direction right okay so what did what did we know what did we see here that so so the root locus it indicates the manner in which the closed loop zeros and poles move so that the response meets some specification so, so my specifications are usually in terms of zeta and omega n and these specifications usually translate to locations of poles so there could be some uh, zeta and omega n which would be may be satisfied by k equal to a square by 4 plus 1 right then i would know right so i will exactly know where the roots are maybe somewhere here and somewhere here right and then i would actually know exactly know what should be the value of k such that my closed loop pole satisfy some some um, some desired specifications or some desired performance criteria okay so i would know how to modify the gain k such that my performance is met and performance is usually mapped to some pole locations okay and I am just doing this only with the knowledge of this guy, right? I started with S, the open loop poles, S at 0, S at minus A, and I am just now increasing the gain K. We will see how, how we will we'll, we'll formalize this a little, little later. Right? So, just by looking at these two, I start with the open loop poles, and these, these are all the closed loop things now, right? As K increases, I am already in the closed loop, right? And then how the closed loop poles are modified starting from the open loop poles. So, I just need to know how the open loop system looks like and I can just do a, a, a good study of the closed loop system. So, I do not really need to compute uh, uh, the, the closed loop poles and then I analyze things and so on, right. So, how are poles related to pole locations related to the to the performance well we we analyze this while we were doing first order systems so just say if uh, for for different values of poles at s1 i will have uh, a faster response s2 slightly slower and the slowest will be for for s3 right so this is like how the how the location of poles influence the performance this we did while we were doing analysis of first order systems Okay. Now, in general, so the first order system was, was very easy, right? So, all the poles are on, on the real line, then okay, the, based on their location, I would determine how are they fast, are they slow, the slowest would be here and the fastest would be very, you know, further away from the origin. Okay. However, for second order systems, there were little, little more details, right? We started, well, we had undamped systems where we had the maximum overshoot, the settling time was infinity. Then we had the case of underdamped systems where we, we quantified you know, or we defined underdamped 
nature in terms of zeta, right? And then we had also when the system was undamped, the the frequency of oscillation was omega n for sigma equal to one. The system was critically damped, and then we also had the notion of of uh, over damped system where this this uh, zeta so it was it was greater than one. Okay. So if I just look at you know the the poles, right? Typically, well, I am just looking at uh, solution to this equation at right? s square plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n square. Okay? So, if I just look at the underdamped case, my uh, roots were minus zeta omega n uh, plus minus j omega n square root 1 minus zeta square. So, this is for, for, for zeta less than 1 if, I, if, we, if, I, if we remember it properly and this guy I said this is omega d. Okay? So, this is the real part here. So, if I just take a, a complex a conjugate pair right, p 1 and p 2, the real part this distance would be this will be at minus zeta omega n and then this guy would be omega d this distance omega d is omega n square root 1 minus zeta square. Right? It is just like, uh, so this is a right angle triangle and I could say that this uh, omega n is just you know square root of uh, this guy plus uh, this guy right? from the from the Pythagoras theorem. Okay. Now, something else. Right? So, this is this is uh, this is what we also call as the omega d. Right? Okay. Now, look at this this guy theta right? and if I say how does cos of theta look like? cos of theta is okay this guy zeta omega n over omega n is just zeta right okay so from this cos of theta is zeta and therefore theta is cos inverse of of zeta okay so let's let's look at this right so if i am at this point theta remains the same whereas omega n changes right if I go here, if theta is the same, then zeta is the same. Okay? Now, if I go from here till here, this distance which is omega n changes, but cos of theta still remains the same. Right? Slightly here also, if I go from here till here, what happens? My zeta remains the same because so theta is the same right? if I am just moving along this line right? and then omega n changes. Right, for, for some given zeta. So, all these lines are lines which I call as constant zeta lines. So, I can okay, go here, right? if I just take any arbitrary line here right, for which a theta would be fixed, if I move along this line, right, what happens is my theta is fixed whereas omega n changes. Okay? So, this, this behavior could be seen from, from th zeta equal to 0, I am here. I keep on increasing zeta and there are all these all these lines are the lines for which the zeta remains constant. So, at this point you will have different omega n, this point will be different omega n, but the zeta here is same similarly on, on, on the other side. Okay? So, these are all constant zeta lines or we just say how the locus of the poles look like for constant zeta. Okay? Now, let me keep uh, omega n fixed and keep moving. Right? And I, I just want to vary theta. So, what will I do? Well, omega n is fixed, omega n is fixed and I just move around some semicircles. I do not want to do a circle because I do not want to go into the unstable region. So, if you look at uh, you know, this guy over here, omega n is the same, omega n is same, omega n is same, same, but each of these will have different zeta. Right? This will have a different angle, this will have a different angle and this will have a different angle. So, if I, if I keep on moving uh, omega n, then I just see, I just move, move, I am just moving around a circle. And this guy also, you know, since all poles exist in complex conjugate pairs, so this guy will also move, moves, uh, just according to how the omega n varies. So you just have some some semicircles here. So there's a pole here, there's also a pole here, and this will correspond to certain uh, certain uh, zeta. If I go here, this pole will move here, and this pole will keep on will move here, right? The complex conjugate, but then the zeta will move. So these are semicircles of where omega n is constant and zeta is changing. These are lines where zeta is constant and omega n is changing. Right? Okay. What is 
what is the importance of this? Then I say well design something such that zeta is some number and omega n is also some number. Say zeta is say 45 degrees and omega n is 1. Okay. So, I have this constant omega n circles and then I, I just draw a line of uh, say zeta or, or say the theta being 45 degrees. So, I just draw a line from here till here and if say this is omega n equal to 1 then my pole should be here. Okay. So, if I have like I will repeat if I want a design specification where zeta should be say some uh, number which corresponds to angle of 45 degrees given a given theta I can always compute zeta right and then and a certain omega let us say this is 1. So, I just find these two lines. So, this is my zeta right and then this is my omega n equal to 1 and the point where they intersect is where I want my uh, closed loop poles to lie and this I know how you know from the previous example that I could vary this closed loop poles just by you know varying the gain. Now, I will just investigate is there any gain which will do for me this. Now, how do I test right? So, that is exactly what we will uh, study in, 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 the, in the root locus case. Okay. So, so this was just, just a little, little example right and now we will see how we can generalize this right do the roots. So, what we saw that the roots were, were, were travelling towards each other they meet and then they go away do they always meet and if they meet do they again have to go do, do they have to go to the imaginary axis or they, they could possibly just stay over there. There was no 0 in our example right it was just s 1 over s s plus a what happens if there are zeros in the system right. So, all these things we will try to, to, to analyze a little more this will lead us to some conditions on the root locus right. So, all these rules is what we will do in, in, in our next lecture. Thank you.